Hello everyone, this is SG DeVries and welcome to my shop today. Today we're talking circle sanding on an oscillating spindle sander. Now you might be thinking that's probably not the safest sanding machine to use, and I would probably agree with you, except that it's one that I happen to have. I don't have a large belt sander, so I have to use what I've got. This is the jig that I will be building today. I've wanted a circle sanding jig for a long time, one that could sand both an external circle and an internal circle, but I just sort of never got around to it. Until I ran into a couple of safety problems with the way I had been doing it. Now the problem with this arrangement, while it might seem like a simple economical solution, is that by clamping this board down to the table, you have this circle caught between two fixed points. And the whole purpose of this is that you want the outside to be smooth, but it doesn't start that way. And so this distance changes as you're trying to sand. And if you're rotating it, and you hit a spot where it's a little bit wider, and it catches on that spindle, it will rip out of your hands and start spinning really rapidly and probably knock your clamps off too. That problem would be frustrating, but you could live with it, except that there's one other problem. Every circle sanding jig for a spindle sander that I have run across seems to have the same issue. I've never heard anyone talk about it, but I've run into it several times and it has, well, it's caused me injury on a couple of occasions and so I decided I had to do something about it. The problem is when you're turning this with your hands. Now, even if you're being extremely careful and tight, first off what happens is if you're turning it, you usually you turn it, the spindle spins this way and you're turning this this way. If it has a spot where it catches, Again, it will rip this out of your hands and spin, but your fingers are still grabbing it tight. And so before your hand can register, this thing has worn a nice groove into your finger and your thumb, or if it's a bigger circle and you're using your palm on it, it'll leave a nice groove across your thumb or your palm where this sharp edge has cut into your skin. Now, I've never had it draw blood, but I have had seen that crease on my fingers and my palm before. The second issue is with your other hand. If that catches, and you're holding it tight, of course, if it catches, again, it's going to rip this out of your hand, but if you can't release it tight enough, it will actually pull your finger into this spindle. Now, I have sanded off half my fingernail before, and it's just like that. Before I could even think, half my fingernail was gone. Now, fortunately, it didn't do anything worse. So, I needed a solution to sand circles on this sander where I didn't have to touch the circle that I was actually sanding. And so, today's jig is going to do that. To start with, I spend a lot of time drawing out these parts on a piece of three-quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. You can see that I have my computer plans printed out next to me, but there's a lot of precise measurements so that I can get both the table and the moving arm out of this same sheet of plywood. It pays to take your time and go slow and double check all your measurements during this step. This piece of plywood is way too big to fit underneath my bandsaw. So I'm just going to use my jigsaw and cut out the two main pieces here, and then I can go from there with the smaller pieces. Even though all my measurements are drawn out on this board, the first thing I do after cutting it off the big section is to cut the hole where the spindle from the spindle sander will go. I'm building this table to work with my three inch diameter spindle. So I need to sand that hole just a little bit larger because my hole saw wasn't quite big enough. I needed that hole drilled so that I could accurately position that board onto the spindle sander table. Now I can use that line I just drew to offset some holes for the mounting brackets. First, I use these locations to drill the quarter inch hole up from the bottom of the board. Then I turn the board over and drill a three quarter inch divot from on the top side so that the heads of the hex nuts will lay below the table surface. Then I make a series of small plywood blocks. Now these blocks are used on the bottoms of the bolts to clamp the table in place. Now I can finally go to my garage and cut these boards down to their actual shape.
there is a piece of T-Track that will get mounted in the table and another piece that will get mounted into the moving arm. So I need to cut those grooves in those boards. You can see here that I have already cut the slot for the T-Track in the moving arm board. Now this board has a really funny shape, so I can't do a whole lot out here with the table saw. I'm going to have to go back into the basement shop and use the jigsaw on this. Before I cut the shape out, however, I'm just going to clean up the bottom of those T-Track grooves. I don't have a little block plane, but the router will work just as well. They say that form follows function, and this board does have a pretty weird shape. But there's a reason for all of those weird protrusions. This funny shape took a long time to sand right, using a couple of different machines, and also a little bit of hand sanding in a couple of the corners where nothing else could reach. And finally, to make all the corners nice and pretty and smooth, I am using a 3 16 roundover bit here, on all of the edges. It's time to mount that moving arm temporarily onto the table and see if all the math I did is right. It's kind of hard to explain why there's that long narrow piece on the close side of the spindle there, but you'll see what that's for once we get to sanding some actual circles. Now that I know the moving arm doesn't need any refinements to its shape, I can go ahead and drill a series of pivot holes. Now I'm drilling four for at one quarter, three eighths, one half, and three quarters inch. Those are the most common ones that I use. Now that the two main pieces of the jig are done, I can move on to some of the attachments. Now here I am building a small stop block which will fit into one of the T-tracks and it will also have a bolt in it to use as a fine adjustment knob. A little narrow strip gets glued to the bottom of that so that it won't wiggle in the T-track. One of the main attachments that I'm building is what I call the drive mechanism. Now part of the whole reason for this jig is so that I didn't have to actually hold the circle that I'm sanding with my bare hands because I've had too many close calls in the past. So I'm building a little mechanism here so that I can turn a crank and it will turn the larger circle. Now this thing is made up of several parts and it would be kind of pointless to try to explain every single little part to you, but we'll go through all the pieces that I built in just a minute. The other main attachment that I'm building is two adjustable arms. Now these arms will have a groove down the center that I can use to have adjustable positioning of some bearings that I will use when I am sanding the inner radius of a circle. The only way I could think of to do this groove was on my router. Now I drilled a hole on each end of this groove that is larger than the diameter of the router bit so that I could safely put the board down over top of it. And so I'm slowly cutting my grooves and then raising the router bit up by about a sixteenth of an inch, and then cutting another groove, etc., etc., until I get that groove all the way through. To be perfectly honest here, this felt a little dangerous to do, and so I might end up having to build some sort of jig or holding block or something so that I don't have to hold boards like this with my bare hands. The grooves did come out really nice though. Now it's back to the roundover bit, so all these little parts I made will look nice and pretty and smooth on the edges. The clear acrylic shield you see is actually part of my dust hood. I have another video on that if you want to check that out. This is the finished stop block which fits into one of the T-tracks. The threaded bolt you see is for fine adjustments. These are two little handles that I turned out of cherry. 
This is the first time using my lathe for something other than playing around. The rest of these small parts belong to the little drive mechanism that I built, and I'll show you how that goes together in a minute. These are those two long grooved bars, and there's also a series of nuts and bolts and washers. The larger of the two handles is for the moving arm. Now I'm leaving this, and I'm not gluing it in so that I can put that handle either on the top or the bottom. And now to attach the drive mechanism to the T-Track in the movable arm. The small wheel on that shaft there has got rubber bands ringed around it, which give it some traction. Now this movable arm, little arm right here on the drive mechanism, has the crank on the top, and the little handle will go into the top of that crank. So when I turn that crank, it will turn the wheel below it, and those rubber bands will brush against the edge of the circle that I'm turning. Now the pins on this drive mechanism are for a series of rubber bands, which are used to keep that wheel tensioned tightly against the circle that I'm turning, but also allow it to move slightly to accommodate for the non-round starting shape. And of course, the stop block fits into the table T-track. The threaded bolt on that stop block has got some Teflon tape wrapped around it to give it a little resistance to turning. That way, when I do some fine adjustment, the vibration of the machine won't you know, move that bolt a little bit. We have all the attachments on the table that we need to sand the outer edges of circles. Now this is a large gear that I am building for a tower crane that I'm making. And I have a whole series of round shapes like this for this tower crane, which is the reason I'm building this jig in the first place. So we'll see how it works. You need your pivot pin to be as tight as you can, but still allow the wheel to turn freely. You don't want it to wiggle. And now I set the drive mechanism up against it so that when I turn the crank, the rubber band keeps tension against the wheel, but still allows it a little wiggle room because the outer edge of that wheel right now is not perfectly round, and so that crank needs to be able to move a little bit. We'll set the stop block here and then give it a go. The drive mechanism seems to be working pretty well. Now I've added a few more rubber bands so that I can hold more tension against the circle that I'm sanding. But um, right now it seems to be working great. With my other hand, I can also move that whole moving arm slightly if I have larger areas that I need to sand off. This is the danger that I built that drive mechanism for, to protect my hands if this happens. Occasionally, that spinning drum will catch the wheel you're sanding, and even if you're holding it pretty tightly, it can rip it right out of your hands. Now, the sharp edges of that spinning wheel, spinning that fast, can cut your hand pretty bad. And I've come had some close calls of that, and so I finally decided I have to build this jig before I lose a finger. Now that the outside is sanded perfectly round, we can work on the inside. I've cut out the most of that center wood with a jigsaw as close to the edge as I could, and those slotted arms that you saw me building mount onto the table with a series of three bearings. Now those three bearings will hold that wheel perfectly still but still allow it to rotate. Now I've mounted the drive mechanism to the T-Track and it's time to give this a spin. You'll notice that the entire contraption moves with that moving arm so that I can pull it away from the sanding drum if I need to, and I won't lose any of the alignment of the way that wheel is set. You can also see now the reason that I have such a long shaft on that crank lever. That's so that when I crank it around, it is above the highest point of that rotating drum. You can also see now 
the purpose of that long sort of curved flange on the moving table arm. That's so that there, when I sand large rings like this, I've got a lot of support underneath it. I have the stop block set here so that if I pull the whole moving arm away from the spinning drum, I can return it to exactly the same position. Now to remove this ring, all it takes is that I need to remove just that one bearing and then the, the disc comes right out. And because I'm not moving the other two bearings, I can return it to exactly the same place. This jig will handle circles up to about 14 or 15 inches in diameter. But you can see on these couple of photos that it will also handle much smaller circles. This circle here is only an inch and a quarter in diameter, and this is the smallest I can go. One modification I did after the fact was I rebuilt the arm that holds the crank spindle. With the wider base, it's a lot more stable, and the crank doesn't wobble near as much when I turn it. So that's the jig. I am very happy with the results. And you can see here that the variation in width around the entire circumference is about three thousandths is the biggest variation that I can find. So that is plenty good for what I'm doing and um, I'm going to get a lot of use out of this jig. And my fingers will be safe. I am in the process of drawing up plans for this jig and they should be available soon. Thanks for watching.